Okay, up on the bench today we have an old tube type radio. This is a Metro Tech Pacer 2 uh, in rather horrible looking condition actually. <laughs> uh, do have the speaker grill that's sitting over there. I just pulled that out because the foam tape that was holding it in there was pretty much gone. But yeah, you can see a dead, dirty, nasty, grimy radio. But it's complete. Doesn't look like it's ever been tinkered with. I don't think any repairs have ever been done to it. Uh, definitely no capacitors have ever been replaced. <laughs> so you can see this has... There, you can just see they're starting to push out the end. They're just, they're just falling apart on their own. So it's probably been a few decades since this thing has actually seen, <laughs> seen a power line. Um, now... This is actually a hybrid radio. It actually has two transistors. Um, so, actually, I just move the camera back up a little bit. And you can see, right here, there's two transistors. And, yeah, they're old as the hills, because they're, what are they, GM 011s, I think? Yeah, GM 011. So, yeah, they're <laughs> old. They're some of the first, you know, first transistors, I guess you could say. Uh, so, you know, it's 1960s vintage. Um does have diode, actual diodes, not diode tubes, but actual, you know, uh, rectifier diodes for the uh, power supply circuit. So, you know, that helps to, between those two transistors and the diodes they're using in a power supply circuit, really cuts down on the uh, amount of vacuum tubes needed in this thing and uh, the size, you know, because you'd need a bigger transformer for the, the extra tubes and, you know, just ex the extra footprint size to, to mount all that stuff. Um, but one thing that's kind of odd with this, see, early CB radios, usually you don't see a lot of tantalum capacitors. This thing is full of them. <laughs> there are a lot of them in here. There's one there, one there, one there, one there. One, two, three, four, five there. Yeah, they're just scattered all throughout this thing. There's another one right there. Uh, so I will be changing all of those. Because this is so old, um, the old tantalum capacitors actually weren't that reliable. Uh, I don't want to say they weren't reliable, but they were in their day. But this is an old radio. Like I say, this is 60s vintage. So I definitely want to get those things out of there. Uh, they just use those because, probably because they're smaller than the equivalent you know, axial-leaded capacitors, you know, aluminum electrolytics. Now, sometimes you'll use a tantalum for a, a specific property that it has, but really in this radio, they're just using them because, probably because of size. I think I counted like 13 of them in this radio, so, you know, that's 13 aluminum electrolytics that didn't need to be in this. Uh, now, I'm actually in the process of redoing the can cap. So this has one big four-section can cap, and it, right here used to be mounted right in here with a plastic P-clamp down to that screw right there is where it used to be. Um, and kind of oddball, you know, as far as values go, 40 at 350, 20 at 350, 10 at 350, and 40 at 150. So since it's under the chassis, it's very easy to just take the can, the can capacitor out, just pop in modern... Uh, axial leaded electrolytic capacitors. Our modern capacitors are just a lot smaller in size than what they used to be back then, so I can I should easily be able to fit the uh, the capacitors down here on the bottom side, um, you know, for individual capacitors. Now the only thing with that is I need somewhere to mount them to because I can't just have electrolytic capacitors flapping in the breeze. They're going to have several hundred volts on them. Um, because that capacitor, pretty much all four sections of this can cap our power supply. Uh, this uh, this first section is the main filter cap. Um, the second one is after I think the first is after the the rectifier diode, and then these are at some of the uh, the lower voltage output taps. The other two sections, but like I said, I'll get them stuck in here. Like I said, I need somewhere to stick those, so I'm going to use a terminal strip. Now I'm kind of stuck with how I can mount one. I don't want to go drilling a bunch of holes in this. For starters, if I wanted to get drill any holes it right here, well, there's something in the way right there. There's a transformer, so <laughs> you know, I'd have to take out a bunch of stuff. Um, so I, all I did was is just took I don't even know how many what's on there. One, two, three, four, five, six. So that's a six terminals, 
uh, well, actually it was seven. I actually cut off this end down here. I had an extra terminal on this end. Just cut that one off so it didn't interfere with anything over here, you know, space-wise. Um, but screwed it down. But I didn't want to leave this end flapping in the breeze. And again, the transformer is directly above that. So I can't really stick a screw there because it sits down flat against the chassis there. So just do like they did back in the day. You solder them down. Actually, this term, with this heavy, and actually that's house wiring. It's factory. Uh, yeah, it's been in there forever, but that's actual, you know, real heavy, like, probably like 14 gauge, you know, AWG electrical wiring for your house, which you'd find in your walls. But the same thing. They just, that's a one terminal terminal strip. It's just soldered to the chassis. Very common back in the day. You'd find lots of solder connections. When they needed a ground, they'd just solder it down to the chassis. So that's what I did here. I just soldered. Or like I, said, I didn't want to leave it flapping in the breeze. And I am going to probably be using that as a ground. Don't know because I haven't laid the capacitors out yet. Uh, most of the positives, of course, are going to be up that way. But uh, I don't want to leave it flopping around. Now, the only thing is, you're trying to solder a steel chassis. And... Of course, this also has a transformer sitting on top of it. You know, the, the steel core is actually touching the chassis on the other side of this. So everything possible that could possibly be trying to suck the heat out of your soldering iron, well, this radio has it. So, and even, even if it was just trying to solder something, you know, back here on the flange, there's just so much metal, you really need a big soldering iron. Um, so, yeah, this was one of those, one of those <laughs> ones where it called for Big Bertha. <laughs> So, Big Bertha can solder anything. I think you could probably weld engine blocks together with this thing. <laughs> I actually even have one that's a little bit bigger than this. I think that's what a 350 or a 400. But this is a, a 300 water, I think this one is. Yeah, this is a... Yeah, get the reflection right there. Come on, light. Yeah, 300 watt. So, it's, it's an American beauty. They're still in business. They still make these soldering irons. You can still buy tips for them. They're really expensive. Because that's a gigantic chunk of copper in that thing. But, uh, yeah, you turn that thing on, it takes it about 15 minutes or so to warm up just because there's so much mass to that thing. I mean, you could, uh, you know, you could shoot, not kill a person. Shoot, you could probably kill an elephant with this thing as heavy as it is. Just be, you could, it's several pounds. But, yeah. Trying to use a smaller soldering iron, I try actually tried 150 water, and yeah, it was okay. But when you're soldering something like that, you want to hit the soldering iron turn, and you just want to see the solder flow out. And yeah, if you use something like this, it's just literally just take it, touch it to the chassis, bam, the solder, the soldering's done. And the reason they work so well is is because the tip is so big. That's one of the big keys to using a big soldering iron when you're you're soldering uh, chassis. You want a lot of mass in the tip because that's your thermal reserve. Basically, that tip is the more metal there is in this tip, it's kind of like a battery for heat. You know, that's your thermal reserve because the heating element can only produce heat at a rate of, well, it's 300 watt iron, so 300 watts. Um, and, you know, that can suck the heat away really fast. So that's why you want something that has a really big, fat, thick tip. So when you touch that down there, yeah, it's. There's no way, basically, to cool this thing down to the point where it won't solder anymore. Um, but, yeah, so I've got that soldered down. So, now, another thing is, when you're doing something like this, normally I would just desolder, because normally most can capacitors would mount to the top side of the chassis, and then the bottom side you would see from down here. This one, of course, laying down on its side, I would normally just desolder all of the wires off of those, you know, components, wires, whatever, soldered to it. That was kind of almost impossible in this because it was tucked down in there. Yeah, there's just no way to get down in with a desoldering iron. Maybe the one top terminal, but the other three, there was really no way to get to it. So I just cut the leads off of it. I'll get it in camera view here. Just cut the leads off of it. And then what that allows me to do now is... So there's, you know, one, two, three, and four... And when you do that, actually, before you cut the terminals off, make yourself a roadmap. You know, yeah, you've got the schematic, you can look at it, but you're going to have to trace stuff out, what goes where. If you just write down a schematic, so, you know, small red wire, that's this one here, single wire, that goes to the 20 microfarad section. This one here, it's got the big sand block resistor, carbon comp, and a large red wire. Okay, that's, you know, but just write it down. Then when I go to put this back together, I've got the little paper here. It's just a lot easier if you have yourself a roadmap. Um, so actually let me get to recapping, so I get to 
capacitors in here to replace that can cap, replace the other, what is there, three aluminum electrolytic. There's one here, here, and here. And then the rest of them are all tantalum. And some of these things, man, they're really buried. I mean, there's one buried way down in here. I think that tube socket's got, what, four? Yeah, it's got one, two, three, four. That tube socket's got four of them on there. Rest of them shouldn't be too bad to get to, but that one, that's going to be challenging getting, changing those caps on there. But I definitely want to change those things because the old tantalum caps, they basically have one failure mode. When they, when they go bad, they're a dead short. So, and like I say, just by age, these things are, you know, <laughs> I guess you could almost say ancient. Um, so we'll get those out of there. Uh, now, the customers told me he doesn't really care about appearance on this. He knows it looks like, you know what, <laughs> he understands that. Um, it's got tape residue all over it. I'll see if I can get, I don't know what kind of adhesive that is. Actually, it looks like it's almost flaking off. But it, it kind of has a rubbery feel to it, so I'm hoping maybe I can just soften that up with something and get it off. I'll see if I, but he said he honestly doesn't care. If it doesn't clean up, it doesn't clean up, he doesn't really, doesn't really care. It's just uh, his father had one of these. Um, when he was a kid, and he used it, so he'd like to have one. He found this one, got it cheap. So, he doesn't really care about appearance. He just wants to be able to grab the microphone and talk, and somebody can hear him. Um, which is another thing I'm going to have to check, because this probably has a crystal element, so, you know, once I get the radio completely done, up and running, we'll have to see if the, uh, if the cartridge in this thing's any good, because uh, that's one problem a lot of times you'll have with the old crystal... Uh, microphones. Now, crystal microphone cartridges are fantastic. You get your best sound out of a crystal mic. They're, they're really, really good sound quality. The problem with crystal microphone cartridges is they're crystal. They're actually salt. It's Rocher salt crystals. And what is salt? It's hygroscopic. It absorbs water. And that's, that's the big downfall of the old crystal element microphones is, man, when they work, they just sound fantastic. But if they've been in any type of damp environment over their life, don't be surprised if they don't work. Because the, the, the salt crystals that are used in there to actually generate the electricity, um, you know, when the diaphragm moves, they if they've absorbed water, they just swell up and deteriorate. And I've actually taken some cartridges apart before that had, you know, had a bad cartridge, cut the diaphragm out, and, yeah, there was nothing left but powder in there. A little actual speck of Rocher, Roche, I think it's pronounced Rocher salt, uh, crystal in there just basically turned to powder. <laughs> so let me get to working here, and uh, probably the next time you see this thing, all the caps should be changed. I need to uh, test all the vacuum tubes, and then I'll be ready to fire it up for the first time and see if it does anything. Well, I have to tell you, I was well on my way to uh, designing a smoke bomb, because I was a not quite yet, but if, if I had plugged this thing in and turned it on once I got done doing what I was doing, I would have had a, I probably would have had a good light show and definitely had a nice pretty cloud of uh, magic smoke. <laughs> so what uh, what I was doing was replacing capacitors. So you see, I've got all these in here, I've got these three uh, axial leads that were in here, the originals, they've been replaced. And yes, yeah, some of these things, I tested these. I mean, it's obvious they're bad. They're, the ends of them are, you know, they're coming out. <laughs> they're growing in length. Um, actually, this one measured like 50-something microfarads, and this one's down in a picofarads. It's basically it'd probably just open. Um, but if you remember, I had said tantalum capacitors. So, uh, that's something white here, an envelope. So if we take a look... This is one of the ones I was talking about. Looks like a yeah, extra light here. Looks like a tantalum capacitor. An early one, but nonetheless, looks like a tantalum ep epoxy dipped capacitor. Very standard. Back in the day, they used to do color banding. As a matter of fact, I've even got some, probably some over here in my tantalum scrap bin. Oh, uh, let's see. Where in the heck would they be? If I can find find some old ones, yeah, grab one of these. Oh, come on out of there, little guy! Yeah, you know, they had uh, you know banding. There, that's the thing. There was different 
styles of banding on capacitors. There was three, four bands. Um, some of them had a dot for the voltage. You know, line on the side would mark would mark the polarity. But the in any case, there was you know, pretty standard. There were several different standardized patterns. So you know, I'm looking at this one, and I'd actually replaced three capacitors. And and the, I was getting ready to do some more. And the more I looked at, I was like, man, why is there a tant? Why is there an, an electrolytic capacitor in this part of the circuit? Just made absolutely no sense. So I pull the schematic out, and I'm looking at it. There's no electrolytic capacitors. Now. For starters, if you work on old radios, you're going to find that the schematics very, very, very rarely match what you're working on. <laughs> Plan on looking at the schematic and finding a few extra dozen parts sometimes inside of a radio, television, whatever it might be. But especially like CB radios. I've worked on some CB radios where I've worked on a dozen of the same model radio. All of them were original when I got them to work on them, and every single one of them was different. None of them were the same. They all had different parts, and you know, it just changes that the manufacturer made to the radios over, you know, the lifetime of that that radio being made. But you now, like I see, I'm I'm and then I got to looking. I was like, wait a minute, there's supposed to be a you know a or it looked like, or at least a non-polarized capacitor going from, let's say, point A to point B, and I get to look at it in this thing, and that's actually what these are. These are non-polarized capacitors that look like epoxy dipped. And you can see there's another one there. Like, they're all over the place. There's another one down here. You know, they have a band that continues down along the edge there that, you know, kind of would make it look like, uh, you know, it would indicate the polarity. But, uh, yeah, it's definitely, and if I test it, now that would that would come out to brown get the flashlight out here again. Brown, black, red. So that would be one zero, you know, normal color banding scheme. So one zero, two's your multiplier, so you know, add two zeros. So that would be uh, one thousand picofarad or one nanofarad or a point zero zero one microfarad. So if we check it, can you see the flexion's gonna get me, isn't it? Will it stand? Let me just turn on the blasted backlight. Maybe that'll help some. Ah, hell, I think it. Eh. Well, let me just get her hooked up here. So I've got one one end of this one unhooked. Yep, nine hundred and forty-four picofarad. So yeah, that's with, that would be within its tolerance. You know, a thousand picofarad, 943. So, yeah, it's definitely a non polarized <laughs> capacitor. Now, luckily, I had only replaced three of them. So, <laughs> yeah, I replaced this one, this one, and this one originally were. Man, the light's just horrible. This one, this one, and this one were originally like, because there's a couple more, and that's actually what I was getting ready to change this one, and then there's another one shoved down in there. But, uh, yeah, I was in the process of replacing these. And like I said, I'm just looking, you know, I'm installing these. And I know what this is. This is the, the uh, output modulation tube. It's a 12AX7. And, you know, I'm kind of looking at the pins on the tube. And I was like, man, why is there a, a there makes no sense. You know, I'm thinking, there's high voltage there. A little tiny tantalum's just going to basically vaporize if I stick one in there and, you know, like I say, some more so. Yeah, be careful. <laughs> first time for everything, and that's definitely the first time I have ever seen uh, capacitors that look like that that are not tantalum. I mean, that's just, wow. <laughs> Talk about confusing. Manufacturers definitely didn't make it easy back in the day. <laughs> With all these parts. And I mean, I even went to the point of looking in the Sam's manual. Because, um, you know, the Sam's manual, one thing that's really nice about the Sam's photo fact manuals, I actually just go to the parts list for this specific radio here. There we go. So, like, C25, I think, is one of them. No, actually, that's the one I was checking there. Yeah, because that goes to the wiper. Yeah, the wiper, the volume control. So, C25. So, 
C25, you come across, you know, it would be a cent, but they, that's the thing. They give you different manufacturers and their part number. Now, you have to remember, that's going to be part numbers for, you know, April 1967, or when it, you know, whenever they actually were doing the editing for this manual. But still, if it was a Central Lab, it'd be a DD-102. You know, if it's a Cornell Dublier, it's going to be that big, long number, or a uh, CCD-102, uh, or a GP-210, or a 10TS-D10. And actually, that's what I looked up was, because I have... Uh, a lot of old catalogs, and I have vintage six, 1960s vintage Central Lab and uh, several different 1960s Sprague catalogs, and I looked up those part numbers, and yeah, they were just cera just normal ceramic capacitors. The DD102 is just a standard one kilovolt uh, ceramic capacitor. Nothing, nothing very special about it. <laughs> you know, just uh, I think it's like a ten or might even been twenty percent cap, but uh, yeah, so. I guess when this ex this exact radio was made, this they got a bargain or what for whatever reason they use these, and I've just I've never seen those. That's a first. So yeah, if you ever work on vintage electronics from the mid '60s, uh, I think for the first time I can safely say if it looks like a tantalum capacitor, well, it might not be. So just be careful. <laughs> Trace out the circuit. Look at the schematic in your service manual, and make sure you're not replacing a non-polarized capacitor with a polarized capacitor like I was doing, because this is actually one that I had installed. This one was <laughs> this one was installed in here. I had that one in there, a modern tantalum capacitor. So yeah, I can guarantee you that thing would have gone kapoof <laughs> if I had plugged this thing in and turned it on. But like I say, there's like 13 or 14 of those little critters in here. So just a word of caution. Um, luckily I caught it beforehand, so no, no magic smoke was released. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so let me get back to finishing the recap job and uh, test the tubes, the whole nine yards. We'll get her fired up and see how she works. Okay, so I've got her up and running now, and uh, it's actually a good working little radio. Um, I did run into one other thing uh, once I <laughs> got her turned over, you know, checked everything, make sure everything's hooked up correctly, uh, made sure I'd hooked up all those capacitors that, you know, I initially thought were tantalum, uh, started to replace and then realized, no, these weren't, uh, and, you know, put them back, the, the proper style capacitors back in, um, tested the tubes, did have, uh, what do we got, four, yeah, four, four tubes were bad, uh, I think the final, what was it, the final, the audio tube, uh, what do we got here? A couple of the, yeah, a couple of the IF tubes. So, uh, and interestingly enough, I think it was, it was at least two, if not three of them, um, the filaments are broken. Uh, you know, plug them into the tube tester, they just wouldn't light up. And actually, if I, it'll never show up in camera. I, I seriously doubt, and I don't remember which ones it was. See if I can even find one. Uh, you'll never see it in that one. Remember if... No, that one was not. That one was just weak. Uh, let's try Let's see this one. Yeah, this is one of them that's broken. I don't know if... <laughs> I seriously doubt I'll ever be able to, to get it. Focus, focus, focus. Nah, you'll never see the wires down in there. Uh, nah, it's just not going to fit. They're tiny little wires for the filaments. They really don't show up in the camera. I mean, you can see some of the larger wires that go from the pins up to the you know, sections of the tube. But the filament wires are tiny. I can actually see... It's just broken off. There, it's like two or three of them were like that. Um, just the wires busted off. So I don't know, rough life, <laughs> radio's been dropped out of an airplane a few times, I honestly don't know. But, uh, yeah, there. so those were replaced. Um, turned it on. Now, before I, you know, when you're doing something like this, it's best to leave all of the tubes out of it. So, you know, if you're doing a restoration on something like this, for starters, you feel safe working on high-voltage stuff for starters, because there are lethal voltages inside of this. Even a little tiny radio like this, there are, you're dealing with potentials in the hundreds of volts uh, 
on the high voltage DC power supply circuitry. But uh, so the first thing I like to do with something like this is leave all of the tubes out. Uh, that removes a lot of things out of the circuit. Now this does have a solid state power supply, so that you know it doesn't. I don't have to worry about using diode tubes where I would maybe need to leave those in. But um, what I like to do on something like this one is just take all of the tubes out, turn it on, but use uh, hooked up to a isolation transformer that's also a variable power supply, and then I just slowly turn the voltage up and monitor the. Uh, what this radio is drawing as well as also I'll, I'll hook up usually two or three depending how many branches there are on the high voltage supplies like this has a minus 112 volt DC has a positive what like 285 there's one at 275 and I think another one at like 255 or something like that but I'll monitor at a couple different places and the voltages didn't didn't look that bad everything kind of looked okay I wasn't checking AC voltage, I was checking DC voltage, because they're DC power supply. It's a DC power supply. And uh, I turned it back off, because everything, like I say, looked okay. Put the tubes in it, turned it on, horrible hum. The instant I turned it on, not, you know, uh, you know not uh, uh, just a little bit. It was, you know, and, you know, it came in as it warmed up, you know, as the tubes warmed up. No, it was just there. The instant I turned it on, and it got a little bit louder than, of course, when the tubes warmed up. I'm like, what the heck is going on here? And, you know, I'm getting into, looking at the schematic, okay, there was a problem, something in the power supply circuit, and getting test equipment ready, the radio still turned on, and just as I'm getting ready, while it's turned on, getting ready to stand it up on its end so I can, you know, grab my signal tracer and try to trace down where that hum is coming from, I heard something starting to go and then all of a sudden, it just fizzled out. And what fizzled out <laughs> was one of the brand new capacitors I just put in there. It vented out. There's a little tiny hole right... I can't even barely see it. Right there, right, yeah, right above my fingernail there. There's a little tiny hole. It, it just vented out. So something called... Now that capacitor was the right value. It was... Uh, actually, I upgraded it slightly. It's supposed to be 40 microfarad at 150 volts, and I put in a... 47 at 160, so 10 volts higher and a little bit higher in the, in the capacitance. Um, so there's no reason that thing should have vented. Um, now that capacitor, this is this only uses. Actually, I replaced them while I was in here doing the repairs. The diodes in this, because like I say, this was solid state, very early solid state, but solid state nonetheless. So it just uses three diodes. For diff different circuits, one of them's a minus supply, and then the other two were used in the, the normal half-wave uh, bridge rectifier setup. But um, the power supply line that hooks up to this one and hooks up through, I think it was this capacitor. Well, apparently this thing's bad. Actually, I tested it with a capac uh, capacitance analyzer, and it is bad. Um, but yeah, it was allowing AC voltage in because remember uh, a non-polarized capacitor will allow AC to pass and it blocks DC but since it was starting to short out or starting to go bad it was allowing the the DC voltage through from another another section it did overvolt this capacitor and that's eventually what led to it blowing but it took a while I probably had the radio turned on for four five minutes maybe some I was not like I had a time timer set, but uh, yeah, I had it on for several minutes, and it finally, it just vented, uh, turned it off, scratched my head for a while, like I say, did some troubleshooting, found out other bad cap, replaced it, turned it on, good, good working, you know, really checked, you know, touching, making sure I had my finger on that capacitor, the, the, the second one that I put in to make sure that it wasn't getting warm, um, and everything looked good, ripple voltage was okay, and right at, matter of fact, right at this capacitor, if I hook up a you know, that meter there, because it will read DC and AC voltage at the same time off the same test leads, and I think it was down to like 5 volts AC ripple voltage, and this is one of the, one of the first, this is, this is not the output of the, the filter capacitor for the output of the power supply, this is actually at the, uh, right at the transformer windings, but, uh, yeah, so, got that, it's now turned on, it's working, um, now if you're not familiar with old radios like this, so this is, of course, crystal synthesized. But 
And back then, you need two crystals, one for receive, one for transmit. So it gets expensive putting quartz in these things. Those rocks are expensive, and especially since ICM, uh, International Crystal Manufacturing, unfortunately went out of business here several months ago, because um, those those were the go-to people for you know custom-cut crystals. You need a crystal for something like this, or whatever you're working on. It didn't matter. You could just pick up the phone, call them, um, you know, and if it was a CB radio, an amateur radio, old shortwave radio, they had the main thing was not only did they make them, they had files or you know technical specifications for old stuff. Uh, ICM, shoot, they even made a few radios back in the tube vintage days, but uh, they had docu. So you could just call them up and say, "I'm working on a Metro Tech Pacer two. I need a crystal for channel, you know, five, nine, eleven, and nineteen." for receive and transmit, and she'd go, okay, you know, bill it to the credit card on file, yep, and a few weeks later, your crystals would show up. It's not like that anymore. They went out of business, and as of this moment, I haven't found what I would call a reliable source for crystals for CB radios, or amateur radios for that matter, or anything else, that is at a reasonable cost. ICM had a reasonable cost for crystals. It wasn't cheap, but by the same token, it wasn't a hundred dollars like most of these other companies. What they want for a custom cut crystal, um, but yeah, that's a that's a whole other story. But uh, so, but how they work is so you have two crystals, receive and transmit. Now, if you had a radio like this, it also has a tune. So, kind of you think of like a Tram D two hundred one. So it has VFO for the tune. Now, before anybody asks, no, you cannot unlock the this tune control so it works with both transmit and receive. Uh, because this is an old radio where the Tram D201 is a crystal synthesized radio, so it uses two crystals, mixes those the frequencies from those two oscillator circuits together, and you know, and it depends on the radio, but it'll use either some or different frequencies. This radio is not like this. This is a lot older, so it has a separate transmit and a separate receive crystal. The uh, transmit crystal, actually I had to look, I had written down some of the frequencies here, what did I have? The, da, da, da. So like for channel 19, the receive crystal is 27.64, so it's 455 kilohertz higher than the actual channel you're on, and the, or no, not the transmit, that's the receive crystal. The receive crystal is 455 kilohertz higher. And then the transmit crystal is a 13.5925 megahertz crystal for channel 19. Um, so, yeah, like I say, it's the... And that's actually exactly half of the transmit frequency. So it actually has a, a doubler circuit. Um, where, like in a lot of the more modern radios, your solid-state radios, they actually have a tripler circuit for, the, for uh, signal synthesis. But... Uh, like I say, what this allows you to do is, is only put transmit crystals in this, and then you have a tune control, okay? And that allows you to tune in then. Now, it has a, what they call a spotter. Some of them will call a spot switch. So what you do is, is you want to... You're basically energizing the transmit circuit, but the driver and final tubes are not energized, but the oscillator circuit is running. So you energize, you turn the spotter on, and then what you do is, is turn the knob... And you see the needle moving here. What you want to do is is peak, peak that for the highest reading you get. And what you've now done is is the frequency that the transmit oscillator circuit is running at that doubled frequency. So, like right now, I actually have the crystal that's in there is channel six. So what I've done is you're actually sending a small portion of that signal to the receiver circuitry. It's registering on you know on the S meter here, and then you're you're calibrating your VFO knob so it's perfectly centered. So you have the transmit and receive then are on the same exact frequency. Uh, the transmit frequencies are not adjustable in this. There's no alignment points in here for that because it's an AM only radio. So, you know, crystals as they fall out of spec, the, you know, the crystals as they, over the decades, fall out of spec, yeah, your frequency can drift rather drastically. Um, but this also has a socket on the front. So, because this cabinet, yeah, you got to slide the whole radio out of the cabinet. Now, a lot of other old radios like this, they might have a little door in the top that's swung out of the way, so you could actually reach down in to get to the crystals. They kind of made it convenient on this one, so, you know, if you had, you know, this has a possibility of 10, or no, 11 channels, but 
uh, well actually 10 and then the crystal socket makes 11 but you can put 10 transmit crystals in here but of course even back then there was 23 channels so you know you couldn't put a full crystal complement in here so what you do is is you pick the, the channels that you wanted put crystals in there now if you had other channels that you might occasionally want to talk on what you do is, is you plug the crystal into that that is for transmit so that's this EXT position right here so you'd put this knob in the EXT or external crystal position and then plug in the crystal for the channel you want to transmit on same thing it's just hooked up to the same wafer switch as the rest of them that are in the sockets in here but and again you know you'd hit the hit the spotter switch and you'd tune you'd tune for maximum receive sensitivity there um, and it's basically it in a nutshell um, now this radio sounds good um, and that clean cleaned up yeah it still looks rather homely horrible whatever you want to say there's absolutely nothing I can do for that it is the finish it has just I don't know if this was in like uh, the middle of a smoking factory or I'm not sure what kind of atmospheric contaminants it is but it is actually soaked into the the paint that's silk screen you know the silk screen painting on this thing there's no way to get it off I got the, the you know all that nasty gunk tape residue off I got the you can see the speaker uh, screen there that's all cleaned up yeah, you can even see my finger in the reflection there that's that's nice and shiny now but the, yeah the faceplate itself it is what it is uh if you try and get that off you're going to remove it and i don't mean remove the dirt you're going to remove the paint because <laughs> i tried uh yeah you can try polishing compound and all you're doing is is rubbing off the the, the paint and it's not getting any lighter it's just like I say, whatever whatever environment this thing was in was in, it's just the atmospheric contaminants have soaked into that paint and it's it's permeated the whole way through to the to the aluminum faceplate underneath. So it is what it is. But the customer said he didn't really care that much about looks. He just wanted it to work. That's what he wanted, was a functional radio. And that's what it is now. It is a functional radio. So uh microphone cord cleaned up nice. If you remember that thing was rather black looking before um, and if you're not familiar with a lot of radios back in the day, the the microphones all look the same. Now, it may not look exactly like this one. There's several different versions. But the majority of the microphones for a lot of your CB radios back in the day, they were all made by Turner. This is no different. All this is is a uh, Turner 3, what is that, a 355C, I think it is. Um, I'd have to look it up in a in an old, old Turner catalog, but I think this is the 355C is the model number. If I remember right, it has the switch with the little piece that hangs down here and this kind of funky look to it. But uh, yeah, I think that's a Turner 355C, and it's a crystal element. It, or not a crystal, a ceramic microphone cartridge in it. And that's actually the easiest way to tell if your microphone is a Turner. Just take it apart and look at the style of m the actual microphone cartridge that's in here. If it looks like a Turner, I guarantee you that's who made the microphone, <laughs> probably Turner. But uh, So I have this, like I say, I have it set right now to channel uh, channel 6. I have a monitor radio right up there, set to channel 6. And actually a spectrum analyzer, it's actually set to channel 6 as well. You see center, center frequency is 27.025 right there. And the span is set to 10 kilohertz, so that's the channel width for a CB channel. And... See, there's the carrier, and if I talk into the microphone, you can hear it uh, transmits fine, and you can see it modulating down there. And actually, if we swing over there, you can see the modulation on the oscilloscope. And I stop talking, let it stabilize. Actually, that crystal's not off that far. It's 27024965, so <laughs> now some of the crystals in this thing have drifted about a kilohertz or more a little bit more off frequency um, so you know th they that is what it is like I say there are n absolutely no adjustments there's nothing you can do if a crystal's out out of spec the only thing the only choice you have is, is basically take it out toss it in a trash can and get another custom one cut or you know there's a few people uh, or companies that deal in old vintage crystals um, Ken's Electronics is one uh, now I stock a lot of crystals here but I don't have quite the quite as many as he does but uh, a lot of times you can get get a hold of uh, like Ken's Electronics or another dealer or somebody that has crystals but just remember when you're getting crystals from a lot of places like that they're old too they're probably just as old as the radio 
Uh, now, if they're a reliable company, um, they'll stand behind your crystals. They'll test them. Now, it's hard. It is honestly hard to test a crystal out of the radio. I've got frequency counters that have a crystal socket on the front of it. I can just plug the crystal in the front of the frequency counter, and it'll tell me what it's oscillating at. The problem is, I take that crystal out of the frequency counter and put it in this radio. It could be a thousand hertz off. The reason is there's capacitance and inductance. Lots of things affect the frequency that that crystal oscillates at. And the frequency counters, its input, or the oscillator circuit that's built into the frequency counter, is completely different than what's inside of, like, this radio right here. So, yeah, it, it, those counters are good for testing to see if it works. But like I say, a lot of those companies, they'll stand behind it if you buy a crystal from them, and it is out of spec. So, you know, it would need to be out a good bit. You know, if it's off only 100 hertz, well, a brand new crystal can be off 100 hertz. Um... But yeah, if it's off like a kilohertz or something, if it's way, way out of spec, basically what would be in the service manual for your frequency uh, specs for the standards, uh, they'll, they'll either refund your money or they'll, they'll send you another crystal. So that's just something to ask when you're buying crystals for old radios like this. If you're buying a crystal from somebody, will they stand behind it? If it, it doesn't work or it's way off frequency, will they either refund your money or will they send you another crystal? Uh, it's always something to keep in mind. So there you go. Oh, now the, the the customer wanted to be able to transmit on channel 19 in this radio. Now, like I said, I have some. I, I have not some. I have a, a lot. I have thousands and thousands of crystals. But of course, channel 19 is probably the most popular channel everybody wants in an old radio. Uh, now you may have local groups like around here, 12 and 17. But you know, um, everybody wants channel 19 because that's where the trucker action is. Um, so, unfortunately, that's the crystal that most of us run out of <laughs> is channel 19. Now, I did have a channel 19 transmit crystal. Um, actually, I have several of them. Here's, here's another one right here. You see, it's 13.5925. If I get the reflection just right. 13.592. Yeah, actually, it's 13.592.5, and that's actually in kilocycles. But, uh... Yeah, and like I say, if you take that frequency and you, you multiply that by 2, that's 27.185. And you can actually see it even has 19 stamped on it, T, actually T19, because that is a transmit crystal. The problem is, this is not a uh, the proper size crystal. This radio takes, as you can see, this will not plug in to the front of the radio. The pins are too far apart. So what this radio takes is a HC25 size crystal. Um, this is a HC17 or HC6 size crystal, uh, which is a lot bigger, so it doesn't fit. Now, I still got it to work in a radio, and I didn't need to make up an adapter or anything. Um, luckily, just the way the crystal sockets are laid out in this radio, you can see how the pins are here. They're kind of offset, and what they have, let me grab a insulated little... All of these inside pins are attached to ground. Okay, so this one, this one, this one, this pin here, the one is hooked up to, and you know, like that one there. All of those pins are attached to ground. And then the other pin attaches to the wafer switch that's down underneath here. So what I was able to, and of course the crystals are designed, as you can see these right here, they're designed to be plugged in in that orientation. But, and the pins, of course on this crystal, they're too far apart. But I was able to swing it around plug the one pin into the, the pin that goes to the, the channel selector switch, and then just rotate it around until it lined up with one of these other ground pins. So, yeah, it is hogging up, what, one, two, three positions, but it got the crit, and that's all he really worried about. He wanted to get channel 19, so it's in there. It has a cha channel 19 transmit crystal in it. Maybe too big, but uh, it did work with no modifications. It's just a matter of mounting it a little bit sideways. Um, you know, and if he's not planning on putting, you know, a full complement of crystals in here, that's perfectly fine, because it's not like he needs the extra holes anyhow. So, uh, there's the top. Like I say, not the most beautiful radio in the world. It's, you know, it's definitely, <laughs> this thing has definitely seen its, uh, seen better days cosmetics-wise. But, uh, the main thing is it works, uh, receives well, and trans. I'm not sure if there's anything, Let me get the antenna switched over, of course. I was transmitting into a dummy load. Uh, let's see, put that external, flip, 
uh, this time of day right now, this time of year, there's usually nothing on skip when the sun's out. Yeah, channel 6 is dead. Put it on 19. Put it on 19, and just wait for somebody to eventually show up. One of the local truckers. But uh, oh, and one other thing. Uh, this radio, like many other tube type radios, I don't know why they did it. The squelches operate backwards in these. So the knob you can see is turned the whole way clockwise. Is squelch off to turn to enable the squelch? You actually turn it back the other way. So yeah, this squelch operates backwards of what you probably think, you know, like a modern radio, if you want to turn the squelch on, you turn the control up. Yeah, these, you actually, you actually turn it down. Um, now that's one thing I do really, really like about tube type radios. I hate the squelch circuits in modern radios with one exception, the, the new presidents with the automatic, their uh, automatic squelch control. They finally, after years and years, have ironed the kinks out of that system and that works great. But, the problem I have with most squelches is you set it and then it, it you know it kicks in or out. There's and if a really weak station's there or you know it's kind of in the background but you'd like to be able to hear them but you don't want to listen to that static all the time. Well, you're kind of out of luck cuz you're either going to have to set the squelch to where it's broken and you can hear that static and then maybe possibly hear that weak station in the background or you've got to turn it up so far that it squelches it out and then you miss that contact tube type radios the squelch works different because it's not solid state it's not just turning on and off it kind of gradually comes in so you'll let me turn the volume up a little bit you can hear it's loud it's loud there the squelch is turned off but you see i can kind of find a a happy medium there it's it almost like it's variable volume i guess would probably be the best because that's actually what it's doing it's muting the audio circuit Actually, it sounds like sounds like there might have been a somebody on 19 there in the background a little bit. Yeah, there's somebody starting to come in. But yeah, like I said, I like the tube type because I can set it right at that break point, and it kind of it, it because the system works different and it's a vacuum tube instead of a solid state device like a transistor it kind of comes in and goes and comes in and goes so it's not just on and off on and off it's either full blast volume or just no no volume or no audio at all i, I really i really like that in tube radios i wish solid state radios worked like that because um, that's the one thing that drives that's why i hate squelch on cb radios like i said with the exception of the newer president radios uh, the automatic squelch like in that President McKinley. I absolutely love that. It doesn't care what you turn that on. It doesn't really care what the signal level is. Until there's somebody talking, it just doesn't break squelch. And the instant somebody starts talking, and it doesn't matter how far away and faded they are, it the squelch kicks off. I swear there's, and I've had those radios torn apart, but I swear there is a little tiny man sitting inside of that radio listening <laughs> to turn, and turning the squelch on and off because it just works too well. But, uh, yeah, this would be my next favorite is the squelch and tube type radio because, like I say, it kind of fades in and out. It's, it's not instant on and off. But there you go. Um, there is a radio that uh, needed some help. Like I say, cap job. Um, couple caps got replaced I did now of course I'm not going to charge the customer for those those what three I think it was of those uh and I'm not honestly don't know what they are actually I got one of them down here in the parts that I replaced hold on a second oh come here little capacitor yeah one of these I really don't know what style this is. And if anybody knows, if, uh, and I even asked I even asked a bunch of people, you know, from back in the day, they sent them pictures of it. Nope, never seen one of those. I asked Buddy over at the radio shop here on YouTube. I sent him pictures of, of these. He's like, what's that look like to you? Tantalum. <laughs> Everybody, I said, yep, that looks like a tantalum. So I'm not sure what style of capacitor this is. I actually cracked one open, um, you know, broke it open, and it seems to be a little small cylinder in there, but it's almost like it's compressed metal. It's not a, uh, a, a foil-type capacitor. 
like you know your axial leaded styles like I you know occasionally will you you'll see me use I'll just reach around and grab some Granted, of course, the drawer I opened up has monsters in it, but, you know, something like this big axial leaf. But these are, it's basically a sheet of paper with a sheet of aluminum foil on either side. One foil layer is attached to one lead, and the other foil layer, layer to the other side. But, uh, yeah, I'm not sure what these are. It's almost like it was a, com it just reminds me of, like, a compressed powder type of capacitor. So, yeah, if anybody knows what type of, and who made that, because I've, I've looked through all the old vintage 50s and 60s catalogs that I have for companies that, you know, capacitor manufacturers, and none of them had this. Nobody had anything that looked like that. Um, anybody that had anything that looked like that, it was a tantalum capacitor, and that, those were catalogs into the, into the you know, early 70s. So, yeah, I'd be interested to know what the heck that little critter is. Um, like I say, the service manual just calls for the couple part numbers I did look up in there in the old Sprague catalog, and I think I had Mallory catalog I think I had looked up. Um, they just called for disk capacitors, just one kilovolt, uh, you know, your normal disk capacitors. So, yeah, don't know what that is, but, uh, yeah, I'm, of course, like I said, he won't be getting charged for those couple capacitors I replaced, because that was my fault. I was replacing parts that did not need to be replaced. But, uh, so, there you go. There's a Metro Tech Pacer 2. Not the most stunning-looking radio in the world, to say the least, but uh, it's a good, good working radio again.